Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. Um, Welcome back to Faithful Politics. Yeah, I am your political host, Will Wright. Had a bit of a brain fart there for a second. Um, I am joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing well, Will. Thanks. Um, And today we're joined by Professor Henry, um, nicknamed Hank L. Chambers, Jr. He's a distinguished legal scholar from the University of Richmond. Professor Chambers has a rich background in several key areas of law, including constitutional law, criminal law, employment discrimination, um, and he has expertise that spans across various uh, sectors of of law to include voting, uh, white-collar crimes, employment discriminations, and we wanted for him to come on the show to talk to us about um, the the whole Trump caper and 14th Amendment and Section 3 and all of those different sort of aspects of of Trump. Um, so we're super, super happy to have him on. So welcome to the show, Professor. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Yeah, and we're super happy to have you. And, and Yes, uh, you, welcome. You came highly recommended by one of our veteran guests, Karina Lane, um, who we just love and adore in this program. So if you're listening, Karina, thank you for the recommendation. <laughs> that makes, that makes yes, two of us. I don't you, know Karina. anybody who doesn't think highly of, of Karina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's a pretty awesome person. So, um, all right. Well, so let's just jump right into this. So um, for for context and for those that may not be following the, the news as closely, um, um, I'll kind of just give us, I'll just start us off and then maybe you can kind of fill in some of the, the gaps. So sure. um, a week or two ago, Colorado Supreme Court um, came out with a an opinion that barred Trump from being on the ballot. Um, shortly thereafter, um, Maine, um, the, their Secretary of State, I believe, um, um, came out with a, a statement um, basically utilizing sort of what, what Colorado did and, and to bar Trump off that particular uh, state's ballot. So, so yeah, so, like, what's the deal with that? So maybe <laughs> maybe you can kind of give us a broad picture, uh, Professor, of what all this means um, and then fill in some of the details of, of stuff I may have forgotten. Sure. Th- there are a couple of things you want to you want to think about. Uh, one is that when we talk about the presidential election, we're really talking about 51 different elections. So each state and the District of Columbia have a presidential election. Now that may seem obvious, but the reason why that's important is that it suggests that every state can do what it needs to do in order to run its election. So we really have a bit of a decentralized process, and that's one of the reasons why different states can do different things. At the end of the day, each state decides on who their electors will be, and the lion's share of states say that whoever wins the election in the state is the person whose slate of electors will be selected, and therefore those electors are going to vote for that candidate when we get to the colloquially called the Electoral College. So when we think that think of that as a background, that's that's sort of the important piece of the puzzle is state by state pieces of the piece of the puzzle. Now we ask a couple of additional questions. Who can run for president? Who can serve as president? We have limitations. We all recognize the 30 35 year limitation. That is you have to be 35 years old to serve. You have to be a natural born citizen to serve. You have to have lived in the United States, I think it was for 14 years in order to serve. So we have certain qualifications. We also have 14th Amendment Section 3, which is a piece of the Constitution that folks have not thought about a whole lot, but it's something that is worthwhile to think about. The 14th Amendment itself was part of the Reconstruction Amendments that were ratified after the Civil War, and the notion is that those amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, were meant to literally reconstruct the Union. So now ask yourself what you need to do in order to reconstruct the Union after a Civil War. You may want to think about who can vote. You may want to think about who can serve. You may want to think about who can't serve. Who can't you trust? Right? And that's really what, what Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was about. It was about saying, look, if you have taken an oath to support the Constitution 
and then you've engaged in behavior that fundamentally violates that oath, then we're not going to let you come back into the government and claim to be willing to serve the government which you tried to overthrow. That's the basic notion behind the 14th Amendment, and it's not necessarily crazy to think of it in that in that manner. Um, so, so that that's the I'll give that as the as the background, and I'll I'll stop there for <laughs> for a second. I I may throw a little bit of religion in because uh, I've actually <laughs> written a little bit about Reconstruction amendments and and how there are some parallels between the Reconstruction amendments and some other stuff. But I'll stop there for for now and see if if there's anything that's that's been unclear or, or where we want to go. Oh no, I I think that's great. Uh, so so one of the primary I don't know if you would call it an argument, but um, one of the the common statements I often hear when we're talking about the 14th Amendment, specifically as it applies, um, or specifically with the, with the Section 3 element in mind, is that it's self-executing. So, like, what, like, what, is that, what does that mean? Um, why is that important? Um, and, and what do you think that the yeah. writers, you know, sort of intended when, when they wrote that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question, it's, and it's kind of a, a general concept some folks have suggested that it has very little meaning, but here's what the argument is. The argument is, look, the Constitution has various principles that are embedded in it, and we can buy into those principles. But how do those principles become reality? Some folks argue that those principles become reality only after we have specific laws that are put into place that that tell us when those constitutional principles have been violated. So if we say it's self-executing, we don't need any additional legislation. We don't need any additional statutory authority. We just look at the Constitution. If it's not self-executing, the suggestion is, well, you need some meat on the bones. You've got the principles, but you need some meat on the bones, and the statutes become the meat on the bones in order to figure out whether or not someone has violated the particular principle underlying the Constitution. Now, one of the reasons why we can talk about self-executing or non-self-executing is if you happen to look at Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, the 14th Amendment is is a pretty long amendment, which is no real surprise. It's sort of the cornerstone of Reconstruction. Section 5 talks about Congress can legislate in support of the amendment. So, so some folks may argue, well, we recognize that there's some circumstances where we're going to need some additional legislation in order to explain the circumstances under which the Constitution has been violated. Uh, other people may, may, will, will argue, well, well no, I, if it's clear that the language of the Constitution was violated, you shouldn't need any additional language to suggest wh- how the constitutional amendment applies. You already have the language of the Constitution. You know, and, and, and if we if we want to throw something in just just for kicks and giggles, uh, mm. think think about how we might view the Ten Commandments as as self executing or not. Mm. We recognize that the Ten Commandments have some commands in them. Well, do we need to do some interpretation to figure out whether folks have violated those commandments or not? And obviously, we're not talking about literal law, but we're talking about just walking through the world. You know, whether we want to talk about, hey, honor thy mother and thy father. What, is, what does that mean? Right, should, should, should we have a little legislation in order to figure out whether <laughs> someone has in our minds violated the honor thy mother and father? Or is it enough to just say, well, it says right there, honor thy mother and father, so however you figure this out, you go for it. Th- those are some of the questions that we're asking in terms of how to interpret the Constitution and whether the Constitution needs additional interpreting in order to be effective. That makes a lot of sense. You know, interpretation is always part of what we do in anything, right? Even basically even getting down to like figuring out life, we have to interpret the different signs and the different, you know, different phenomena that we see and and receive and try to figure out what's going on. There's not, not, it's the same kinds of ideas, right? When it comes to use the same tools of thinking, when it comes to, the constitution or anything like that you have to interpret and figure it out thinking about interpreting all of this and understanding it with Colorado and Maine right taking Trump off the ballot um what what 
how do they differ from each other? These two, like, how have they interpreted? How did Colorado interpret it? And then how did Maine say, oh, they interpreted this way. Did they just take what they did and just, like, lay it over what they have? Or how do you work through this? And, like, can you just copy and paste, you know, what Colorado did and then find and, you know, find and replace Colorado with Maine? I mean, in, in the document, what what is what are kind of the processes there? How how do they interpret that? Yeah, it, 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 basic style is we go back to the language of the Fourteenth Amendment, and, and we ask, hmm, what do we do with this? Now, what Maine Maine Secretary of State will will argue, I didn't do anything. Right, Th- that is. Y- y- President, former President Trump, qualify for the ballot based on uh, based on signatures and things along those lines. So, so he's qualified for the ballot. And unless I hear something different, I'm going to put him on the ballot as the administrator. But then in Maine, you can challenge. Voters can come up and challenge and say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa. This person who you're putting on the ballot, we think there are reasons why they shouldn't be on the ballot." And that's why Maine Secretary of State then had to ask, well, okay, is the president a legitimate, uh, can he legitimately be listed on the ballot? And I, and I say that just because Maine didn't reach out to decide this issue. Colorado didn't reach out to decide the issue either. That is, a, a number of Republican voters complained that they wanted, not necessarily they wanted Trump off the ballot, but they wanted the decision to be made regarding whether or not he should be on the ballot. And and here's where I'm going to give you sort of the, the flip side of the issue, because, because well, in order to answer the, the, the question of how they determined the issue, they really just looked at the constitutional language and said, let me make my best determination from a legal perspective regarding whether there was an insurrection, whether the president was involved in that insurrection, and whether the president is allowed to serve as president. Now take that question and now ask this issue, or think about this issue. Do you want to have someone on the ballot who's disqualified from serving in the office? And the reason why why I put it that way is, you can see why some Democrats would want former president former former President Trump off the ballot, but you can also see why some Republicans would want him off the ballot and why they're the ones oftentimes who complain that is and this is driving it right the Republicans are driving this it, it, exactly because part of the question now, now there can be two different kinds of Republicans who want the question answered that is one set wants the question answered early so they can full-throatedly support President Trump. And another group may well say, whoa, 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 we don't think the president is qualified to be on the ballot. We need to know that early so that so that other Republicans aren't wasting their votes on someone who's never going to be able to serve anyway. So look at this way. The, the analogy that folks that some folks have noted is, let's take President Obama. Let's take former President Obama. He served two terms, can't serve a third term. Well, would you want him on the ballot, assuming he could get enough signatures to get on a a Democratic primary ballot, would you want him on the ballot? Well, there are a whole bunch of people who would say, no, no, because there's still people who will vote for President Obama. You don't want him on the ballot because he can't serve. So why would you want him on the ballot? Well, with President Trump, you at least want to figure out the answer before you go down the path of, hey, can the president, can the former president be our primary victor? Can he be the Republican Party's nomination? It's like, no, 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 no. Let's figure that out now as opposed to later. So you can see why a number of Republicans would say, hey, I don't want him on the primary ballot because if he wins, now we've got to worry about someone who may not may not qualify, who may not be able to serve. Um, so in, in some ways, this is sort of a pressure release valve to figure this issue out. Now, certainly it doesn't necessarily feel that way because it feels like there's a lot more pressure out there. And certainly there's some pe- people who are arguing you don't have to decide the issue because it's possible that 
President Trump won't win the Republican nomination. It's possible that President Trump wouldn't win in the general, even if he were the Republican candidate. That's fine. But there are a lot of folks who are saying, no, 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 no. We need to figure this out now because you talk about crazy. Crazy is President Trump gets the nomination and we still have now a bunch of questions in different states where they've got to figure out, should we put him on the general election ballot as the Republican nominee? And Republicans who don't think that President Trump is qualified will absolutely go berserk in terms of saying, great, now you've got someone who's on the ballot who can't qualify, who can't serve, completely throwing votes away. This is a problem. So it's it's a messy situation, but it's a question that probably ought to be ought to be resolved. You, you know, that's that's so interesting. And and I, I should I should note that we're recording this on January 2nd, 2024. Um this will be released on Saturday, uh, and there's a lot that's that's likely to happen <laughs> between the time that we record this and and on Saturday when we release it. Uh, one one such thing is I know that in the Colorado ruling, they had stayed um, sort of the provisions of their opinion like till the fourth. Um, because if, if I recall sure. from the reading, was L- like let me close my window. I'm 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 oh. hearing a leaf blower. Y'all yeah, yeah, might sure. be hearing a little bit of hum in the background. Let sure, me, sure. Let me Thanks. take care of this. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Sorry so, about that. <laughs> uh, so in so for 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 many for many of those people listening on the West Coast and on the East Coast, we're we're still sort of like you know grappling with the after effects of fall. We actually have leaves that fall on the ground. Like I, I'm from the West Coast, so like. <laughs> But I never uh-huh. had to like worry about leaves like growing up. But uh, but anyways, go, going back to to the January January fourth date, um, if I recall, that the reason was uh, to give um, the Supreme Court of the United States chance to take up the the case. So can you kind of talk a little bit about that? About you know what or if SCOTUS will take it up um, or you know whether they should. Um, I know that there's been yeah. some debate about you know so like federalism right so like is it the states or is it the the federal government kind of thing so i'd love to kind of just get your take on that yeah so 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 let me give you a little piece of getting into the weeds just a little bit in part because i think it's really important for folks to to recognize what's going on and why these dates are coming up and why it's it's pretty messy one of the things that states are required to do under federal law is get their ballots in place 45 days before the election. Because what they need to do is send those ballots out to our armed, our, our armed forces and to Americans who are overseas who have a right to vote in elections. So now you've got to go out 45 days before the primary because you've got to do you've got to print your ballots and get them out early enough to get them to folks. So so for those states that have ballot deadlines or that have primaries in March, we're, we're pretty much up against it. And that, I think, is part of what's going on in, in Maine and Colorado. Uh, now, we recognize that the, the spring is the big time for, for primaries, so that's why these things are, are popping up. And that's why folks have said in early January, we've got to get this resolved, we've got to get this taken care of. Part of what's interesting is the court could very well say, we're not we're not touching this right? that is states it's up to you you all can try to divine whether or not the president is qualified to serve or not y'all figure it out and there's time you know, one could see the court saying at the very least there is time because all we're talking about here is whether the president will be the Republican nominee and that technically won't be determined until the Republican National Convention in the summer. So, in theory, the court could say, let's wait, let's find out whether the president will be the nominee, and if we find out that the president's going to be the nominee, now we'll decide the case, because surely the Republicans can figure out something to do in at their convention to select somebody else if we determine in the summer that the president's not qualified. But if the president doesn't win the, the, the Republican nomination, then we don't have to say anything. So you could see the court saying, uh, we're not mm. getting into this. Yeah. On, the other, on the other hand, it, 
one can understand why the court ought to determine this issue and say, yeah, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to say whether President Trump's qualified to serve. And we're going to say that because in order for the primary process to work the way it's supposed to work, you really ought to know whether everyone who's on the ballot is qualified to serve. Uh, hmm. But but it may well be that the court says, that's not our problem. Hmm. We, we, we decide issues only when we absolutely have to decide issues, and we don't think we absolutely have to decide this issue yet. Hmm. Uh, it's it's a mess. I can I can see the court coming in both directions, and I can also see the court saying, we can live with deciding the issue, but we don't want to do it on two weeks' notice <laughs> or yeah. three weeks' notice. There's just too much to think about for us to do this. Now, that's not to say that they can't, but one could understand if their position was, yeah, we're not going to do this. Um, we're we're going to sit this one sit this one out for a little while, and we'll think about it, and we'll figure it out sometime before before the summer and the RNC. Because the because yeah. they could still write in Trump's name, though, right? I mean, if if Trump doesn't get the the nod, um, I mean, he's got quite the following. Um, so I mean, wouldn't it, you know, like so if there's one train out there, and I know we're we're just sort of like speculating at this point, but but like if if they decided to wait after the convention. Um, to decide to take up the case if Trump doesn't get the nod from the RNC, I mean, like, like, wouldn't wouldn't it make sense to also, you know, still hear the case because I mean, Trump could win by a write-in campaign or something like that. The, the, there is the possible. There is in theory that possibility, depending on the state where you live. That is when we're talking about this being a state-by-state process, same thing with ballot access for the general election. So there's some states where you don't get to write in in any fashion. That is, you can only take people who have qualified for the ballot in a particular way or particular fashion. There are also some states where there's sore loser provisions where if you ran as a candidate for for a party's nomination, if you lose that, you can't be on the ballot as an independent, for example. Mm. So, so, so that we would we would go back to that to that kind of messiness um, that is that is out there. Um, of course, just from a pure political perspective, I, I don't tend to make predictions. There's no way a writing candidate's going to win the presidency. <laughs> yeah. So, mm. so. <laughs> So, so, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you from a, from a theory perspective, and I'm, I'm all, always happy to, to, to spin out stuff, but whew, th- that's one way. And you can't even – one can't imagine, I don't think, President Trump even running in that, in that manner because um, he'd lose. And, and it would yeah. be so obvious um, that there's just – no way. He but, couldn't but do I, it. His I, ego couldn't you. take it. Just say what you think. His <laughs> ego couldn't do it. <laughs> sure. And, well, and, and the thing about it is, it's it's understandable because there are a lot of yeah. Republicans whose response would be, "I'm not voting for a writing candidate. I'm voting for the Republican yeah. nominee." So for now sure. the number of people who who would even be willing to write him in is now so it would now be so small that I can't imagine that 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 would occur it's far more likely that a trump writing candidate would guarantee that president biden would be reelected that it's hard to imagine hard to imagine you know president trump doing that un- unless his notion is i i'm going to control the outcome regardless <laughs> maybe um but it's that's that that's a tough one but but it could be it could be a fun episode of 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 some of a podcast right <laughs> yes it definitely could be dude we got to yeah. come back and we just got to imagine all this and then we can get it written down by chat gpt and give it someone to create like a series and we're going to be the new top series and we can all have our names attached to it you know i, I want I, I i yes it actually is not a bad idea so um I want to talk a little bit more about these actual, like, like the reasonings that Colorado and or Maine gave. Like, for instance, so we have some, we've kind of gone through, um, I say we, my my partner, 
uh, Will has gone through the uh, <laughs> the writings and has and gotten questions and and he's gotten yep. the the pages and on page eight the court found by clear and convincing evidence that President Trump engaged in insurrection. So, what was that evidence? And are you convinced by it? Do you feel like they made a good case in that in that? Yeah. Specific yeah. instance. Here, here's here's the thing. Let me let me let me put out the structure and and suggest what kind of the messiness is. There's no question that in the in the wake of the fourteenth amendment, or I should say in the wake of the Civil War, that folks recognize that the Confederacy engaged in a rebellion or insurrection or both. So part of the question is what qualifies as rebellion or insurrection under the 14th Amendment when we're no longer talking about the Civil War? Right? That is, yeah, we recognize we wanted to stop Confederates from serving in the government uh, unless there was a good reason to allow them and, and Congress could remove that disability under the 14th Amendment, Section 3. Now the question is, well, what qualifies as an insurrection? Now... I, I, I will I will say that in the wake of January 6th one of the things that I that I caution folks to think about or caution folks on saying was calling it an insurrection that that is it wasn't the civil war but the question is what was it and and part of so part of what's going on is the courts the court has to come to the conclusion that what happened January 6th some of the things that happened surrounding January 6th qualify as an insurrection now i don't have a problem with folks making the argument that it should be an insurrection i don't have a problem with folks coming to the conclusion that it should be a, that it should be deemed an insurrection uh, but it, it struck me that we needed to take a little bit of time well now we've taken that time and we've seen what was going on and we've seen a lot of the evidence surrounding it and it it's it is hard to say that it that it was just a protest right cuz that's that's really been the the question is was it a protest that went too far or should it qualify as an insurrection that is should it qualify as an attempt to overthrow the government now the reason why I always suggest that we take a step back and take a little bit of time is to figure out what do we really mean by that? If you're just talking about a president who says, go make your voices heard. Right? Go make your voices heard. And try to convince people that, in fact, I won the election. That's one thing. Now, some people would continue to say, boy, I don't know. That, that, it seems as though we had an election. It seems as though we counted the votes. It seems as though we, we know what's going on. So, so it's not real cool to tell people to try to convince others that I won an election that I lost. But that's, that's something where you go, oh, okay, maybe that's within the realm. But when the court says, boy, President Trump, when you look at all of the things surrounding January 6th, when you look at Jan what happened on January 6th, the things surrounding it, and what the president said, the argument is, well, when you say we have to fight like heck, paraphrasing, we have to fight like heck, and you should go to Congress and fight like heck, because otherwise you won't have a country, th that sounds like go there and by force make sure that I am installed as president. And if you've got an election where someone else, through constitutional means, has won the election, and you say from down the street, go fight like heck to make sure that I'm the guy who is put into office, boy, that sounds an awful lot like we're going to overthrow the government. So, so I think the notion is that Colorado's position, main position is, what happened was there was an attempt to reverse the results of an election, not through convincing people through talk, but through force. 
And at that point, we can understand why folks would conclude it doesn't seem as though, based on answering that question, that President Trump can serve. Now, both Maine, Colorado put a stay on their decisions, essentially saying, we've come to this conclusion, but we recognize that the Supreme Court might have a different opinion, and we are more than happy to not act on our conclusion until the Supreme Court tells us whether, in fact, we're right. Hmm. And that essentially is where we are right now. So and I would tell folks that while I can certainly see the argument that there's an insurrection, that there was an insurrection, the president can't serve, I also understand that the Supreme Court's position may be different, and the Supreme Court will presumably tell us what their position is on the issue, and then we'll go from there. And it's pretty clear to me, based on what we've done in the past, that whatever the Supreme Court says, that's what we'll live with. Whether they decide the president was not involved in an insurrection in a way that would lead to his disqualification or that he was, we'll likely sit back and say, okay, it's the Supreme Court's decision. The Supreme Court made it, so let's go ahead and do it. In the same way that after Bush versus Gore, we didn't see rioting in the streets. I mean, there were people who were were very, very ready to pound out op-eds. And boy, they sure did. But nobody rioted in the streets, right? Because frankly, that's, that's not really something we really do much anymore when it comes to those issues. That's not to say that we don't have riots. But we don't tend to ride in the streets behind presidential elections, even in circumstances where in other countries we might expect people to do so. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, from broadly speaking, I'm really nervous about how a lot of this stuff is going to pan out. Um, I I will say if there's one glimmer of hope and, you know, that small, small age hope um, is that we'll finally maybe get a definition of, of what insurrection um, is because like, because I mean, for our show, like we, we, we do a lot of um, episodes, talk to a lot of people, especially around sort of the topic of Christian nationalism. And we look at a lot of Supreme Court cases. And, you know, so in a lot of these Supreme Court cases that deal with religion kind of in the public spaces, you know, there's there's reference to like the lemon test. Um, and lemon test has like sort of a three prong, you know, sort of like provision to determine whether or not something violates the establishment clause, whatever. It feels like we should have something like that for like an insurrection, <laughs> like like don't you think? It, so that that's actually a real real interesting real interesting issue, and you may want to ask why do we want a definition as opposed to writing the notion in our heart that you don't engage in anything close to an insurrection. So so let me give you an an example. You may well say. I'm not asking for an example. I want an answer. But I'll give you an example just for kicks. God bless his soul because we're not in the position of God resting his soul. God bless his soul, President Carter. What a lot of people remember from President Carter is that he essentially suggested that I've kind of committed adultery if I have lust in my heart for another woman. There's some to the notion of saying, you know what? Few of us may agree with him. We may, we may both say, you know, President Carter, if you want to define adultery, it's a long way away from lust in the heart. But it may be worthwhile for us to think about the concept of him saying, yeah, why don't I not even get close? Write it on your, write it on your heart that you shouldn't get close. And that's really what the principle is about. So it's not necessarily that we want a definition of insurrection. We haven't really needed in a definition of insurrection for Article for, for Amendment 14, Section 3 purposes because nobody came close. So in some, <laughs> in some respects, you know, do we want it? And, and here's, part of the, here's part of the problem and why I'm, I'm with you. It would be nice to have a sense, but I'm concerned about the definition, and, that's, and here's why. What a lot of folks will do is say, well, insurrection was put in to Section 3 in the wake of the Civil War. 
So maybe insurrection looks like something that is pretty similar to the Civil War. And if you're looking for something that's pretty similar similar to the Civil War, you know, January 6th was awful, but it wasn't the Civil War. And as a consequence, that doesn't qualify. And now we start asking, oh, well, well where, where were the lines? And, and that gets tough. On the flip side, you may well have some folks who say, okay, when we say insurrection, what we mean is challenging the government through violence regarding a duly passed law. Right. And and not just calling that a crime, but calling that an insurrection. And now you start asking, so what do we do about riots, <laughs> actions that are challenges to laws that we think are laws that ought to be challenged quite forcefully. And let's assume we're not talking about harming people, but let's assume that the violence we're talking about is burning down a building that we know is is not occupied. Now, again, don't do it. And again, that clearly is a crime. But would we call it necessarily an insurrection? So, so in some ways... We kind of hope there's a definition of insurrection, but in some ways, any definition that's drawn, we might be troubled <laughs> to see it. <laughs> and you know, I, I think we can say the same thing right, regarding adultery. I, th- I, th- I think a lot of folks would say, well, let's define adultery. Well, is it, is, how, how do we do this? Should, should we go Jimmy Carter style? Should we take a step back and, and maybe ask uh, former Vice President Pence, right, who, who famously won't meet with, at least historically, would not meet with women alone. Mm-hmm. Um, I, now, I don't think he's saying that meeting with women alone is adultery, but it's clear that he's saying, I want to be away from temptation. I don't think he was saying, I just want to be, I want to be away from sexual harassment suits. I don't think he was saying that. <laughs> I think he's saying something along the lines of, I just think it's better and more proper for me not to meet alone, not to meet with women alone. Uh, there are a lot of us who would say, hmm. That's a little much, don't you think? Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but, but do we? Yeah, but but do we want to define adultery? Do we want to just say, okay, for everybody, stay as far away from the line as you think is appropriate? Uh, mm. It's it's a, it's a. I think it's a really interesting and fascinating question. Yeah, yeah. And so so going back to the report, um, there was a mention about a a ruling from Justice Gorsuch, um, and I'm curious. I mean, just you know, take it from a non legal like person um is that is that trolling or is that sort of like or or is the the ruling they mention actually applicable to the case that they were presenting yeah i i think that their their mention was for the bigger issue the broader issue of whether courts should keep some people off of ballots because one of the arguments that has been made is well let the people decide based on whoever is on the ballot, let the people decide what they want. And I think the court's position was, well, well, hold on a second. Justice Gorsuch, when Justice Gorsuch was Judge Gorsuch, Gorsuch, noted you can keep people off of ballots if they haven't done what they need to do in order to qualify or to be qualified for office. So, so the So the general idea of let people vote for who they want to vote for may be a general thing, but even Justice Gorsuch has realized that there are times when it makes sense to keep people off the ballot. And, and like I say, going back to, to part of our earlier conversation, yeah, it makes perfect sense to keep people off the ballot if they can't serve, because all they're doing is confusing the situation. They're not getting people's real evaluations of who they want in office, that is, who they want in office who can, who can serve. Uh, so I think that that was, was their notion, is, is that they just wanted to note that it's not a crazy thing to remove someone from a ballot when they are disqualified from the ballot and can't serve. So I don't I don't think they were I don't think they were trolling just a troll. I think they were saying, "Hey, 
we all recognize that there are times when you just don't put people on the ballot, even people who might win elections, you don't put them on the ballot. Hmm. Mm, that makes sense. You know, it's uh, this is all so complicated and it's all so messy. You know, I'm, I'm imagining the um, I'm, I'm imagining like the difference between like our country and all the institutions that we have and the way that we've worked in it and then what people from another like like someone from like China well, I wonder what they would think of just like a regular person who's lived under this communist government or whatever and they look at our I wonder what they think when they look over at our at our country and they see this stuff and we're trying to you know, keep people off ballots. And I'm not saying they love it. I'm just wondering what's going, what's going on there. That's not necessarily, that's not really my question. It's more of like a thought, like um, what, this is such a weird moment that we're in as a country. For me, I feel very weird about this. Um, just, I don't know. Weird is the only way it's the best word I can use. Cause I don't want to say afraid. I don't want to say freaked out. I don't want to say, I'm about to like get tickets to another country and go live there. I don't want to say any of that stuff because I love this country, but it is a very um, tense moment, very tense. And we have all this talk about the civil war and how this isn't the civil war and it wasn't like the civil war. And yet, of course, we don't want to go through an entire civil war to say, oh, that's insurrection, right? Like kind of what your point, we want to nip this, we want to nip this in the bud. So in that kind of idea on page 38, right? In this, in this report, just thinking about it, it says, nor are we persuaded by president Trump's assertion that section three does not bar him from running for being elected to office because section three bars individuals only from holding office. So what was, if I understand that, what was Trump getting at there? What's the difference between running and holding offense? Holding office. Yes. Yeah. What? Yeah. I, th- I, I think. It, I think his point was: Look, I can run w- whether I can serve or not. I mean, that's so, so bad, right? I mean, that's like that's <laughs> like such like a like a really like like why would someone say that that they can still run even if they can't serve? Because if I can make the argument that I can run and not serve, then maybe the Supreme Court never makes this decision. If the Supreme Court never makes the decision, then I may get elected. And at that point, the question is, would the Supreme Court have the guts to deem a someone who was elected president unable to serve? I mean, if, if we think that there's pressure right now, imagine a situation where <clears throat> the Supreme Court says, let's wait on this. One, let's wait on this to see whether President Trump wins the Republican nomination. And then after President Trump gets the, the Republican nomination, let's wait to see if he wins because, hey, if he doesn't win, then we don't have to oh, decide this it, issue. Oh, it would be far worse. Right. And so, far, so, far so, worse. So you can understand why President Trump would say, let's not decide this right now. Oh, yeah. just, just, let me, just let me run. We'll see what happens. And at the end of the day, what are you going to do? Now, imagine January 6th on steroids I know. at the U.S. Supreme Court as the U.S. Supreme Court decides the issue. And I'm not suggesting that the, that the U.S. Supreme Court would, would back away from it or, or would shy away from the decision. But one could imagine the Supreme Court saying, by the, by the time they got to that point, well, you know, it's it was a con, it's a conceptual thing, and because it's conceptual, and the people actually decided that they wanted the president to serve again, that we're just going to punt on this one. They could decide that it's not self-executing, right? So, so you could so you can imagine if President Trump is worried that in fact he might be knocked off the ballot, then he's going to make whatever argument is sensible to just say don't decide the issue yet and and I think that's his his position is I should be able to run even if I can't necessarily serve and he would certainly say I should be able to serve 
I didn't engage in insurrection, but at the very least, regardless, I should be able to run. Because I'm 35, natural born citizen, lived here for 14 years on those scores where it's clear that I should be able to run. I, and I haven't been elected twice. I should be able to serve. And having and, and since I'm I'm able to serve, I should be la- allowed to run uh, and the people should decide. That that I think is what his argument was, and that and that's part of the fight, really, right? Part of the fight is: should I be allowed to run, regardless of whether I can serve? Should you necessarily kick people off the ballot who are unqualified, or should you just let the the voters figure it out on their own? Because there may be a number of voters who say, "Well, I'm not going to elect anybody who was anywhere near an insurrection." That is, regardless of whether there was an insurrection or not, I'm not going to vote for them because they were near an insurrection. Okay, fine. If that works, then President Trump doesn't get the nomination, and we don't have to worry about this. Um, so I think that's I think that's what he was saying. And and I want to be fair. I don't think the argument that he's making is it uh, is a, a crazy argument from a legal perspective. Right? That that is. I understand him to say that in his mind, at the very least, one might argue that the insurrection point is a close question. Therefore, let me run and figure it out later. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, sorry. So, 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 like, is is this whole, you know, legal argument about whether Trump can or can't be on the ballot just like this huge political Rorschach, Rorsch, Rorschach? Rorschach? Rorsch, I forgot how you say it. You know what I'm talking about, the ink block, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> like, is it, is it sure. just one, one big test? Because it, it would seem to me that if, you know, if, if, the, if the argument is clear that he committed an insurrection and Section 3 says, yeah, you know, you can't, you can't run, you can't be on the ballot, then all 50... You know, some odd states would would be like, "Oh, okay, well, we'll just take them off the ballot." Uh, but you know, right now it's you've got Colorado and you've got Maine. You know, two blue states that Trump probably wouldn't win anyways. Um, and and it seems like like at this stage, it seems like it's very political, um, and uh, it really kind of just shows pe- where people kind of stand politically. You know, if you support it great you know you are blue if you don't support it you're red um so i i'm i'm curious on like what what are the broader implications of of you know trump not being on the ballot and why are some states um specifically even california i think recently said that yeah trump's going to be on the ballot you know like why aren't all courts seen it the same way that that maine and, and colorado are seeing it well so so let me throw in a little bit of possible political jujitsu to be honest Hmm. if I were if California were in play then arguably Democrats would want Trump on the ballot because you get to hammer on President Trump's closeness to an insurrection without the court saying that it was an insurrection the other piece of the puzzle is, if you believe what the what some of the polls say, why would Democrats not want President Trump on the ballot? The suggestion is that's the only Republican President Biden can beat. So, so in, in many respects, it's not clear to me at all <laughs> that that Democrats. I mean, I mean, yes, Democrats. Some Democrats, many Democrats, are fearful of a Trump victory, but. Uh, for those Democrats who, like I say, who believe that President Biden can only beat President Trump, and some people would, in fact, put possibly President Biden in that category as well, in terms of who would you rather run against? Trump. <laughs> it's it's not clear to me that you want President Trump off of the primary ballot. Uh, it's not even clear that you want this discussion happening before the primary. Right Now, All of this discussion, absolutely, people may well want to have after the Republican National Convention, if you're a Democrat. 
Right? And like I say, this is one of the reasons why it doesn't surprise me that there are a number of Republicans who are making the argument, because I think for Republic, for many Republicans, particularly non-MAGA Republicans, their take is, I don't want them on the ballot. Right? You, you, you want one of the other folks on the ballot because the belief is, is likely the case among non-MAGA Republicans that the best chance to defeat Joe Biden would be someone who's not Trump being the Republican standard bearer. So I'm not terribly sure that that we're getting the politics of this right at this point um, because there are a lot of people, I think, on both sides who have some feelings. Now, obviously, there are a number of Democrats whose position also is no one should allow President Trump anywhere near a presidential ballot. No question. There are a number of, of Democrats who are, who, who are taking that position. Um, but I do think that, that this is arguably bipartisan. <laughs> you can find Democrats and Republicans who want him off the ballot. You can find Democrats and Republicans who want him on the ballot. Um, so this, this is going to be this is going to be wild. Uh, what, what, I, what yeah. I will say and, and what, what troubles me a bit, and, and some people might say, Come on, man. This is the way it's always been. It would be nice if we looked up and said there are tons of people who are so well qualified for president that we don't need to take people who have a lot of nicks and dings. Right? <laughs> this is not a scratch and dent sale at Sears. We need people who are of the highest quality to run and I'm not and I'm not saying who is and who's not but I wish that the notion in our public was there are so many people who are so highly qualified that we should be having a national conversation about multiple people at the primary level and at the national general election level where we should all be very happy at least reasonably happy with who got elected now we'll always have preferences right we'll always have preferences but I think it's fair to say that the idea from people on sides that this person is truly unacceptable as president or that person is truly unacceptable and they're the candidates running, I don't get the sense that that's always been the case. Even in my lifetime, that hasn't always been the case. I mean, sure, we, sure, every presidential election is contentious, but the idea that the other guy is simply disqualified not because of insurrection, but just because of who they are. That that's that's nuts, right? I mean, that's that's yeah. nuts. To to me, it's kind of reminiscent of of when you think about people who you might want to have serve as your pastor. Yeah, you have a preference, but yeah. it's not. Well, this is the only person who could ever pastor my church. Oh, come on, <laughs> I mean, come on. That's 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 nuts. Yeah, right? because because the other piece because the other piece of the puzzle is what happens if if the hand of God steps down and that person is removed from the field. Yes. D- does that mean that oh my goodness, there's no one who can qualify? No, no. The point is that we've got many many people who can qualify, many people who would be very good at the job. That's the thing that we need to to think about from uh, from I think our our national perspective. Yeah, you know it's funny because all of this to me in my mind comes down to the fact that Trump doesn't like to lose. I seriously feel like that he does not like to lose. He started saying it six months before, eight months before the election. If I lose, it's because it's stolen. I mean, what kind of, what kind of statement is that? If I lose, it's because it's stolen. So anyway, I mean, I, I'm very... you're so you're so right you're you're so <laughs> right about that you're so I mean, let, let me let me throw I I hate to cut you let me throw this this piece in because this is this is something that I tell yeah, that it. I tell my friends do it also on the question of interpretation and that's this I said on the on the the Wednesday or the day after the election in 2016 I guarantee you that Hillary Clinton thought to our to herself I can't believe I lost Wisconsin yeah on the day after the election in 2020. President Trump, I guarantee you said, I can't believe I lost Michigan. But they mean it in two very different ways. <laughs> and, the, and the problem that you run into is most of us think, 
about the Hillary Clinton point. It's like, oh, yeah, she's saying I got fewer votes. I can't believe I got fewer votes. I should have got happen? more votes. Yeah. What President Trump is saying is, no, 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 they're wrong. I actually got more votes. And, the, and, the, and you just sort of slap your forehead and say, come on, man. Really? It, you lost. You yeah. lost. It's, it's, it's okay to lose. You're not supposed to yeah. complain about it. You know, everybody loses. And in fact, if he had said, fine, I lost. I can't believe America is crazy enough to not elect me. People would have said, okay. A- and then maybe he runs again in 2024. But that's yes. very different than saying, okay, make everybody think that I didn't lose and go fight like heck to make sure that, that I'm put into it, back into office. Like, dude, that's just not yeah. how we do I, things I mean, here. it's like... The and I honestly feel like this whole entire country is being taken on a ride because of this man's ego, because he can't stand the fact that he lost, and he wants to and he wants to prove that he can win again. And I mean, I, I don't I. It's just it, it, it's really difficult for me because when you're talking about like I, I feel like a political orphan. I've said this several times on this uh, on this podcast because I'm not a MAGA Republican. I feel like in many ways I'm a Republican, for sure. I'm very conservative. I look at the I've read both of the Democratic um, platform and Republican platform in the past and very much found myself on the Republican side, right, for whatever reason. And I can look at I'm, I'm willing now, I wasn't, I didn't used to be, but I'm willing now to look at every single one of those Positions and and really and really look at them and see if they're correct and if I should be holding them or not or allow them to be challenged. But I feel like I'm I, I just feel like a political orphan. I I don't have they this MAGA Republicanism and I think that there's a lot of people in the Republican Party that's like I really just why can't he just go? Why can't he just go? Because it's yeah, tearing the yeah. Republican Party apart. And he's and and it's and it's damaging the Republican Party's ability, I think, to really compete in the future, um, because of where our our country is headed. And I think the progressive nature of where our country is headed, it's going to be very difficult now. I think to even get a rallying cry around anything with the Republican Party because it's so divided. Um, there, yeah. there. Uh, here's my question, kind of for you, and then I think Will will have the last question. But what are you most concerned about when you're looking coming into this next? Even, and you can focus on both legally and on like in personally, whatever you want to share. But what are you most concerned about with this upcoming election and this election year? What, what, yeah. what do you like kind of think about when you're having your coffee? in the morning or at night and then push away when you have to go get to work. Yeah, I, I, I'm most concerned that we're not having conversations, the kinds of conversations we're supposed to have. I'm, I'm worried that people are not using their minds and they're not thinking about various issues. And I'm, I'm not going to tag any, any part of any party or, or what have you but sitting down and saying, "Hey, can can we just sit down and 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 break some bread, and and figure out what's what?" And yeah, I realize people go, "Hey, breaking bread! You're talking about the body of Christ." No, 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 no! no. I'm just talking about can we just have lunch? All right? I mean, I'm not saying you got to come to my lunch. church and lunch. take lunch. communion. Christian nationalism, lunch, right? <laughs> and, it's like, and and it, because it it seems to me. That even in my lifetime, and I realize that for, that for for youngsters out there, they're gonna look up and go, "Dude, you're old." It's like, okay, I'm not that old, but in my lifetime, there's a time when we would say, "We agree on eighty, ninety percent of stuff, and we can fight about the ten percent." Yeah, I do feel I mean, that way too. Yeah, I mean, I mean there was a t- there was a time even in the twenty, even in the the two thousand eight campaign, where the fight was really not about whether we were gonna do expanded and hopefully universal health care, it was about how we were going to do it. And then somehow in 2009 and 2010, we seemed to drift away from that to, well, should we do anything at all? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Nixon in, 70, in 68, 72, all, we've all been for universal health care. The question has always been how and can we afford it? 
But now we seem to have gotten away from even the concept of whether we do it. Now that's something that I think it's fair to say that the three of us can agree on health care for the people. Sure. I, I, I think I, I think the, the fellow who is kind of our guiding light would say, yeah, you kind of need health care for the people. Right? Yeah. You know, I understand. Food, shelter, clothing, I'm pretty sure our, our guy would say, yeah, that's kind of what you need. And I'm yeah. pretty sure that lots of people, even those who don't rock with our guy, would say, <laughs> yeah, just as a general concept, food, shelter, and clothing – from the nation that is the richest nation on the earth, yeah, that's probably cool. So, yeah. so, so getting together and talking about those things is like, let, we can put Joe Biden to the side, we can put Donald Trump to the side, we can put all this stuff to the side and just ask, what do we want for our country and what do we want for our children? And can we just have that conversation? And we're going to find out that among the lion's share of us, we're looking for the same stuff in general. It's just a question of how we get there. But if we're just focusing on how we get there as opposed to the very basic stuff, we can make progress. Right? We can really make we can really make some progress. And and that's that's one of those things that it's it's a it's an interesting messy thing. Uh, but we've seen it in the church, right? I mean, you know, I, prayer, big, big prayers for the for the Methodists as they seem to break apart. Um, maybe they need to, but you y- you hate to see it. But there are lots of churches where you have these discussions, and sometimes you break apart, and sometimes you come together. But you move forward, and you try to move forward in the best way you possibly can. That's that's what bothers me is that I'm not sure that these conversations can be had among lots of people. Uh, and and I I just wish we could could have these discussions, grab some lunch maybe breakfast, maybe dinner, whatever folks want to do, and just talk through issues and find as much common ground as we can before we then say, all right, we're out of common ground. Now let's get to the politics of it. That's uh, that's awesome. And um, Josh was right. I did have a question, but I don't want to like poison your your very profound statement that you just had. Go by... for it. See what happens. <laughs> No. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll call it a vaccine or an antidote, right? We start, we start, we start vaccines with the poison. So let's go ahead and do this, right? Okay. Well, my so my last my last question was was revolving around uh, Lawfare has a uh, great Trump disqualification tracker. Uh, they uh, on it. They've uh, they've got like nine potential states that are that are sort of like have pending legislation or pending court cases. Um, I I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about like what do you think um, is next? Um, not necessarily Supreme Court related, uh, but you know what what can we expect from maybe some of these other court cases uh, with uh, you know Trump being on the ballot or not? Yeah. It, there's some things that are, are going to be kind of wild. Well, one, it depends on what the laws in the state are. So so some of the states almost certainly will have a a specific either law or what have you that says don't put people who are disqualified on any ballot. Some states may have rules that say don't put anybody who's disqualified on the general ballot. So that's a time. So that'll be a timeline question. There are also going to be some some states that have later primaries, so they may have a little more time to figure out what to do. And it may be that things sort of overtake them. That is, if enough states decide that they want to disqualify the president, such that the Supreme Court is now really required to act, that may take care of it. That is, as soon as the Supreme Court says no. President Trump is qualified to to be president, all the other litigation goes to the side. So it may well be that the, the calendar may decide things relatively quickly. By the same token, some of the early primaries may decide things. Now, the thing about Colorado, right? Remember, Colorado's position is we're staying our decision. So, in other words, President Trump stays on the ballot until the Supreme Court says something. Well, if the Supreme Court says we're not saying anything, or if the Supreme Court literally says nothing, <laughs> just 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 says, you know what, we're on vacation for a couple more weeks, then it may well be that this gets taken care of because the ballots have to go out. 
So if the ballots go out for the first couple, first several primaries, and the notion is, well, functionally speaking, the president's on those ballots, and if the and if the president ends up winning those primaries, it may be that the calendar takes care of at least the first piece of this, and then we settle into the, all right, what will the court do if the president wins the nomination? Um, and and the, but but the questions get arguably get different there, because now we're talking about well, what do you do with a candidate who's won the nomination as opposed to just a candidate for the nomination and buckle buckle up right buckle up but but part of the buckling up should also be a national discussion regarding what's january 6th about and and there's some folks who who really need to be asked some questions and and this is not to to call anybody out but Let's really, as a nation, ask Josh Hawley, what was it about? Let's ask Mike, uh, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, what was it about? Let's ask uh, Senator, uh, 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 Senator Mitch McConnell, what was it about? And, and I mean some real serious questions. So, so let me give you an example of a real serious question to, to ask. Mitch McConnell were to think about, and that is, Senator McConnell, your wife was serving in President Trump's cabinet at the time. What were you thinking about on January the 6th? Th- that is, is it possible that he really never thought that there would be a problem or an issue? Because it's, it's something that came up when... Um, when when Mitt Romney complained that uh, that that Mitch McConnell didn't do anything, uh, and what 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 went through my mind was, well, Mitch McConnell doesn't need to ask or hear from Senator Romney about what's what. If he's worried about what the president's going to do, I assume he'll ask his wife. So, so, so a lot of things, a lot of questions that that we ought to to ask in order to interrogate what people think about January the sixth, and it may be the case that after talking to lots of Democratic and Republican lawmakers and being honest about it with discourse among folks like us, we as a nation may say, you know what, it really was an insurrection, and that's something that ought to color how we decide issues at the polls. Or if the national vision is, no, what happened wasn't an insurrection, it was a violent protest, which can be distinguished from an insurrection, then fine, that can be what we decide as well. But we really need to have that conversation as a, as a country. Uh, and, and I recognize that people would say, well, but Congress did that with their, with their hearings. Fine. But that's not enough. We as as we the people need to continue having these conversations and we need to really put people's feet to the fire. Every member of the House of Representatives is up for reelection or election this year. Right? So I think it's a fair question for folks to continue to ask Mike Johnson, what were you thinking about January sixth? Where were you? What were you doing? What concerned you about it? What do you feel about it? Do you think it was an insurrection? Because I think it's important to mm-hmm. to find out whether folks think it was an insurrection or not. And if one party thinks it's an insurrection, or one part of a party thinks it's an insurrection, and the other party does not, then we got we need we, we need to re- we really need to have some conversations <laughs> uh, because we can't have two different visions of what happened, two diametrically opposed visions regarding what happened on January the 6th. Uh, and and, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I will be honest about it. January 6th was not the Civil War. That doesn't mean that it wasn't an insurrection. Um, but we can have conversations about it. Right? Mm. We can have conversations about it. That's, that's so awesome. Well, um, Professor Chambers, thank you so much for your time, expertise. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this was, Man, it was such a joy. Yeah, super it's fun stuff. It's fun. Super it really lightning. Was. And uh and we will love to have you back, especially yes. kind of as some of these more cases become, I don't know, more 
prominent. We in need the, legal in the expertise. <laughs> we need something to cut through the legalese. Let, let me let me let me throw out one one piece that that I uh, have have talked about and written just a small amount on in the past, mm-hmm. and I just just throw this out to 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 a couple of men of faith, and that is what I've done in part is likened the Reconstruction Amendments to the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Mm. Th- that is, a lot of the language of the Constitution was written in 1787, and a lot of that language is still applicable. But we have to look at it through the lens of the Reconstruction Amendments in the same way that we look at the Old Testament through the lens of the coming of Jesus, at least if you're Christian. Obviously, folks who aren't right. Christian don't need to do it that way. But it, in some ways, that's the notion. So, so the reason why I throw that out there is that when we then think about how we interpret language in the Constitution that was not explicitly altered by the Reconstruction Amendments, mm. it can give us a new way of thinking about that old language in the same way that we can sometimes have a new way of thinking about Old Testament language. I like that. We know what it, we know what it meant before this, the, the, the New Covenant, but now we look at it a little bit different, and we live yes. our lives mm. consistent with what we think those words meant through the lens of the New Testament. And that's, and that's kind of the way that I think about the Constitution is we ought to look at those old words through the lens of the Reconstruction Amendments, which really reconstructed state and federal power. If we look at those mm. old words through that new lens, then that allows us to think about how we should be living as American constitutional actors. Um, mm. That's to to me to me it's 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 obvious because that's the way I look at the at the Bible. I I know that there are other folks who look at me and say, "You're nuts." That's a, that's a that's too overtly Christian. I'm like, well, well, no, it's just new language that applies to old. To it's older, just the method. Older thinking, mm. exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that's really cool. Um, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So if you have like any writings or anything like that about that, I, I'd love to just include it in our show notes, just so people sure. can can have access to it. Yeah. But, sure. Um, I'd love but, yeah. to read it. Yeah. Ab- absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll send. I'll send along. All right. And awesome. uh, yeah. So thanks again, and uh, to our viewers and watchers. Uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Thanks, guys. Uh, Fabulous. Hmm.